Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Troy Moling, and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Glad you could be with us. We've got lots to get to on today's show. And beginning our broadcast, the passage of the 2018 Agricultural Improvement Act was cause for much celebration. It's better known as the 2018 Farm Bill, and the legislation includes funding for things like crop insurance, SNAP benefits, and more. But many in agriculture are particularly excited about the inclusion of one alternative crop, hemp. Now, hemp has garnered controversy due to its similarities to marijuana, but proponents say it's harmless and perfect for Nebraska. Within the over 1,000 pages of the 2018 Farm Bill, there it is in black and white. Industrial hemp is now a legal crop to grow. The bill removes hemp from the controlled substance list, a place where it had been since the 1930s. You can thank its more notorious cousin marijuana for that, a plant which is still illegal to grow at the federal level due to its use as a recreational drug. Both hemp and marijuana come from the cannabis family, but the psychoactive properties present in marijuana are basically non-existent in hemp. UNL's Dr. Ishmael Dwykat has been researching hemp at the university for three years. He, along with some Nebraska farmers, see it as a promising crop with a number of uses. You could use it for fiber, you could use it for a grain. It has so many beneficial in terms of medical uh, treatments for so many different diseases. and can be used for uh, arthritis, for uh, epilepsy, for diabetes, for uh, help you to sleep. In addition, the grain, you could use it for oil, you could use it for food, for human food, for animal feed, and the stock we could use for fiber to make clothes, to make fiber for wood, you could make concrete out of it. In fact, hemp can be used in the manufacturing of roughly 25,000 products. And now that it's not on Schedule 1, people are more willing to talk about it, quite frankly. Bill Accord is president of the Nebraska Hemp Association and believes the crop can be a key player in revitalizing rural Nebraska and giving new hope to the family farm. Nebraska farmers need this. I mean, we're very, our biodiversity in crops and agriculture is, is, is not good in Nebraska. We basically don't have biodiversity. We've got soybeans and corn. We need biodiversity. Hemp could do that. Hemp, hemp can be grown. It's a short growing season and you can grow f food crops right after. You don't have to summer, summer farrow. Dr. Dwykat first became interested in hemp during the drought of 2012. He realized the crop's potential when he was driving through the state and saw that many corn and soybean fields were brown and dying. However, the patches of wild hemp that had been ignored were still thriving. This ditch weed has been here for the past hundred years. It's overcome so many obstacles in terms of disease and insect and drought and year in and year out, these plants keep coming back, which means that they are adapted to here to our environment. And not only to Nebraska, they are adapted to the Midwest area. He says if a farmer can successfully grow corn or soybeans, they can grow hemp. Seed to harvest takes about four months. It's fairly resistant to pests, and hemp can even help detoxify the soil. The hemp plant is able to absorb all the bad chemicals from the soil. So we call it bioremediation. The Russian government uses hemp to clean up the soil after the Chernobyl disaster. They use hemp to clean up the soil because the roots is able to absorb the bad chemical like cesium and modify it into the blend. It grows like a weed, <laughs> you know, uh, to make a little joke. Um, but it, it does, it grows well. I mean, it, it grows under very adverse conditions, but it'll grow almost anywhere. It's a perfect food. Had to, you could live on it. You might get a little bored, but you could live on hemp seed. So it seems like a no-brainer, right? Well, it might not be that simple. Next week in part two of this story, you'll hear what has to happen in order for hemp to be grown 
on farms in Nebraska and why people like Ishmael and Bill are afraid taking too long could leave the state's farmers behind. Moving on now and hey, got milk? With calving season well underway for many producers, it's important to make sure the newborns on the farm get all the nutrition and protection they need. That's where Clostrum comes in. Market Journal's Maddie McIntosh talked with an expert to find out exactly what Clostrum is and why it's a must for your operation. With calving season in full swing, producers need to make sure they're setting their calves up for success from the moment they enter the world. And the best way to do that is by ensuring they get their fair share of colostrum before the day is done. Colostrum is the first milk that is produced by the mother cow or dam. It's extremely complex and it has important immune factors, important nutrients. Colostrum is about 22% solids compared to 12% solids of normal whole milk. Much of this extra solid is immunoglobulins, but cow colostrum also contains energy, proteins, vitamins, and minerals. Immunoglobulins are antibodies that give that calf that first protection for common diseases and also infections. When they are inside the cow, the immunoglobulins are such large molecules that they cannot pass through the placenta to the calf. So there's no immune transfer from the cow to the calf. So when that calf is born, it's born without any immunity and it needs to get immunity from the environment for common diseases and also infection. So that's the importance of colostrum. Not only does a producer need to make sure a calf gets enough colostrum, but that it receives it in a timely manner in order to ensure that it absorbs the antibodies needed to fight off infection and disease. So ideally the calf will be up and nursing within an hour and consume five to six percent within six hours and the same amount by 12 hours. So for an 80 pound calf that's two to two and a half quarts per feeding and by 12 hours old that calf should have consumed at least a gallon of colostrum. By the time that calf is 24 hours old, very, very low percent of antibodies can pass across that intestine to the calf. So that's the reason that it's very important. While getting colostrum from the calf's mother is the best, it may not always be an option. Wall says not to worry, as there are alternatives you can use, and storing it is easier than you think. You know, if you need to have other sources, you can get colostrum from other mature cows in your herd. You could purchase some or get some from somewhere else, but you have to be careful. Make sure you get it from healthy cows. Talk with your veterinarian and consult with him to find out what would be the best for your ranch with experience that he has. And a lot of times, maybe we, when we have gathered some colostrum, we want to freeze that and we can freeze it and it will keep well in the freezer for up to a year. And one nice easy way is if you use a gallon Ziploc bag and fill it half full, that will be two quarts. If you lay it flat, it will store easily and you can stack other things on top of it and you have an increased surface area. So when you go to warm up that colostrum, it will warm up quicker and never use boiling temperatures to warm that colostrum up because that will break down the antibodies and the antibodies are what's very important in colostrum. So use a warm water bath to warm up the colostrum and if that water gets cool, just go ahead and add more hot water to that. And when it comes down to it, Wall says it's better to be safe than sorry. And there may be times where you're unsure if that calf received colostrum and you can go ahead and feed that calf colostrum. Maybe you have to milk out the dam or if you have colostrum on hand, you can bottle feed that calf or use an esophageal feeder. But just remember that you need to get that colostrum into that calf within that first 24 hours so you can have a good shot at making it to weaning and going on and there will not be any sickness with that animal. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Maddie McIntosh. For more information on Clostrum, you can go to beefwatch.unl.edu or contact your local extension office. And it's time for this week's market segment. We've got Iowa State University ag economist Dr. Chad Hart in the chair today. And we're going to talk about floods, planting, host of other things too. Chad, always great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. I wanted to begin with an update on the flooding. And Nebraska got hit hard from the floods. Iowa, where you are, did as well. 
How have the floods impacted farmers out your way in terms of planting and what their rotations are looking like for this season? Well, in this case, the flooding, you know, it had a big impact, you know, on, on our western flank, you know, your eastern flank over there in Nebraska. And it's, it's a little early to say in terms of, okay, what sort of shifts we're going to see through the rest of the year. As we're looking right now on the planting side, um, you know, in March, USDA released the planting intentions, which showed, you know, more corn, less soybeans. The flooding and, and the generally wet conditions uh, typically mean that we're going to see some farmers shift from corn back to soybeans because of the, the planting delays and the pressure building up there. And I think the big thing to watch there is as we go out, especially two, three weeks from now, I'll be watching that crop progress report to see how planting is going on there. It's that third, fourth week in April that's really critical as we start to look at corn planting throughout the countryside because it's in that period of time there that roughly half the crop gets planted. Yeah, and that leads into my next question about the crop progress report. We're seeing planting for spring wheat. It's about 4% behind the five-year average corn, pretty much on par with averages. Was there anything else from that latest report uh, of note to you? Not yet. I mean, I think that's the deal. With this one, it was the first one on corn. Um, if I remember right, it was the first one on spring wheat as well as we look there. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, the idea is, you know, corn, it's real early, only 2% planted nationwide. And let's face it, the vast majority of that's down in Texas. Right. So when we're looking here now, no, I'm going to argue the critical one's two to three weeks from now. But we want to watch that, if you will, that progression as we're going forward here. Basically, how well does the southern corn belt get going before we get up here to Iowa and Nebraska and really get into the heart of the, the production season? But, you know, late April, early May, um, looking at, you know, historical five-year averages, like I say, it's that it's that third, fourth week in April that we really want to sort of start to, if you will, sweat the details within the crop progress report. Gotcha. And Chad, I've read where some folks think we're going to see a fluctuation in commodity prices from the flooding. Some say not so much. Some say uh, too early to tell. What do you think? Give us an idea of where the markets are now and where you see them going. I think when you're looking at the markets, as far as the flooding is concerned right now, the markets are sort of shrugging and going, okay, there's not much an impact now. I think it comes back to this planting progress and what's going to happen there. In terms of the lost grain uh, that we've seen in the grain bins that we've lost there, it's a great personal tragedy, but it's not a market tragedy. It's not big enough, if you will, to drive markets and market prices to change right now. But if this flooding continues and we do see planting delays really be exacerbated here, then we will see the market price react to the ongoing wet weather. Again, it's not just the flooding. I'm going to argue it's the generally wet conditions across the entire northern Corn Belt. So when we're talking about planting soybeans, we've got soybeans that can be planted into June without yield losses. Now, for farmers with fields that still have too much flood debris in them or they won't dry out in time, they could do that. But then when you look at soybean prices, we're about a dollar to a dollar twenty below that break-even point. So does it even make sense to plant soybeans, what do we do in a case like this? Well, I think in cases like that, it, it makes sense for farmers to evaluate, okay, how much work and effort do I really want to put in? Do I want to try to rush this land in or do I take my time, recognize prevent planting is going to help at least protect me on the revenue side here and you know manage through this? I think for some producers, if you will, the itch to grow a crop is going to be more than enough that they push forward with some of that flooded out land and, and try to get it into crop production. Others, and let's face it, you know, some of the damage that we're seeing, especially in the, the southern end of the um, Missouri River, you know, sections in Iowa and, and Nebraska, you're not going to be able to clean that up in time to even get soybeans in. And so we're going to see some land couldn't come in in production even if we wanted to. Some land can come back in rather late and the more than likely it's going to have to go to soybeans. And so it's just a mix there of, of again, what's the person want to do and sort of the economics of what drives them. Okay. And Chad, back to prices for a second. And I wonder if prices are really even going to improve that much because, I mean, I've read where you've even said that agriculture globally is just so incredibly productive and you know, that goes for all crops, really. So there's just so much supply out there. So from your point of view as an ag economist, what do you think is going to have to happen here? Well, as you say, the idea is global production is at basically record highs. 
when you look at global corn and soybean supplies as they currently stand, we're looking at record levels there. We've had an overproduction issue in the markets for the past few years. Even with this flooding going on right now and, and the worries about plantings, expectations are we're looking at another good set of corn, soybean, wheat crops as we move through this coming year. And you know, in order for prices to improve, we either need supplies to get shortened somehow, and typically natural disasters are what do that, or we need some demand pickup somewhere along the way. I think the challenge that we're facing right now is that demand, instead of building right now, is weakening in spots. And that's what came out of today's USDA report. When you look at the WASD, they pulled back, especially on the corn side, when we're looking at usage. Very good. Dr. Chad Hart with Iowa State University. Thanks again for the insight today. We always appreciate talking with you. My pleasure. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Daryl Peel. He's an agricultural economist from Oklahoma State University. So if you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll pass your question along. Next, what role do modern farming practices in corn production and ethanol play in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. A USDA analysis released just over a year ago and revised in 2018 takes into consideration new corn production practices and how corn ethanol production achieves a 39% reduction in greenhouse gases at an average plant compared with the baseline for gasoline. The same study projects that by 2022, corn-based ethanol will achieve a 44.3% greenhouse gas reduction compared with the gasoline baseline. You can read about ways in which corn growers and the ethanol sector are reducing their footprint in the April Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, the week started off so nice, but then the weather did a complete 180 on us. Give us an idea of what's ahead. Well, Tori, you're correct. We did see some very warm temperatures early in the week. In fact, we started to see some planting take place in portions of South Central and Southeast Nebraska, according to local reports. And then yet the blizzard started to move into our region as we got into the midweek period. And it's finally ex uh, exited our region as we got into early Friday morning. So far, some of the totals that have come in, and these aren't exclusive to Nebraska, as we're only getting what is reported electronically. Best, type, I guess, is anywhere from 8 to 12 inches on the higher end of the snowfall totals and not as much in the way of significant drifting. Now, I'm sure we're going to see some totals come in much higher than that. But for broad-based coverage, this storm did not perform to the expectations of the models at least 24 hours before the event. And that's a good thing. That means we'll get rid of the snow a little bit quicker. And of course, we're getting into that planting season, so we're kind of getting tired of these continual snow storms. So as we look at today's map, here's that deep upper air trough that is now down in Texas, shooting a ton of moisture up toward the eastern corn belt. Uh, this wave last week was projected to impact us like a blizzard, but it's staying to the south of us. So most of the precipitation will remain along the Gulf Coast. Very heavy moisture across Texas. Alabama, Louisiana, and points to the north. And then as we get into the day on Sunday, we'll start to see this system move into the eastern Corn Belt. Low pressure sits up near northern Ohio. A tremendous feed of moisture coming into this region. We're going to be looking at widespread one to two inch amounts of precipitation, even higher in some locations. In our region, we'll stay dry as ridging takes place into our region, and that will hold all the way in through the middle of next week as high pressure remains firmly in control. We do see a surface low showing in southwestern Kansas, but there's just not a lot of moisture to feed with as it's being robbed by this system. So only precipitation we see to our rest is over the central Rockies. By the time we get into Tuesday, we start to see this trough deepen rather significantly. And the question is, will it lift out into our region or will it remain to the south of us? So a surface low starts to develop in Texas, and that will start to push moisture into our region. The first of the moisture starts to develop over the central Rockies. And then as we go into the day on Thursday, we'll start to see this trough deepen just like the midweek system. Big fetch of moisture bringing moisture right to the north of us, and we have low pressure in eastern Texas. This is a classic setup for heavy precipitation across the central and southern plains. You can see the southern Nebraska is under the gun for heavy moisture as well as points off to the east. And then that system starts to move past our region as we get in the day on Thursday. We'll start to see an end of the precipitation, particularly in eastern Nebraska. 
A little bit of residual moisture may be left over in southeast Nebraska as the main core of heavy moisture once again hits those areas impacted by this weekend storms. And then that system moves off to keep continued precipitation in the eastern Corn Belt as we go into the day on Friday. And we can start to see the low pressure starting to exit off the eastern seaboard. That's still going to keep that precipitation in place. We do see a little low pressure system to our north, but once again, it's basically just following the northern jet and there's no moisture associated with us. And the better news is as we look at the 8 to 14 day forecast, that cold conditions start to move to our east. And these warmer conditions start to move into our region. And in terms of precipitation, finally start to see a dry forecast. Now, one word of caution. This is in advance of that system coming out of the southwest and it is not expected to hit us until at least Wednesday uh, at 10 days out. So we do have an opportunity here at least to get some corn production planted and hopefully conditions will improve, Troy. Thanks, Al. For our final story today, when you think of Japan, things that come to mind might include sushi, anime, or your Toyota sitting in the driveway. Agriculture isn't usually a word that's on the list. However, one of Japan's strongest pockets of ag is led by a man whose future success was shaped by his time spent in Nebraska and the skills learned here. Backed by popular demand, here's a story we first brought you in September of last year. Kumamoto and Nebraska, two states in two different countries, separated by an ocean but connected by a promise of opportunity. Kumamoto, technically a prefecture, if you want to be exact, is located in southern Japan and home to almost two million people. It's led by Governor Iko Kabashima, now in his third term, a charming man with big ideas, a love for agriculture, and a heart for Nebraska, the place he once called home. Growing up in a poor farming family, he had his own agricultural dreams and came to America to make them a reality. I thought I should uh, become a rancher, but before I become a rancher, I want to study how to raise cattle. So I came to the uh, United States as agriculture trainees, and uh, that's why I came to the uh, uh, University of Nebraska as a part of the program for three months. And in 1968, that's where this story begins. It wasn't an easy road for Kabashima. His English and math skills were still a work in progress, but through hard work and countless hours of studying, those three months eventually turned into full-time university enrollment. When I entered the University of Nebraska, uh, I was already uh, get the straight A's, so they let me become a, a special student. And the, special student, not only we get the tuition fee free, and also not only we get the scholarship, but uh, they let me research from a freshman year. As the years went by, those dreams of having his own ranch expanded, along with his opportunities. Kabashima earned degrees in animal science and agricultural economics from Nebraska, and later a PhD from Harvard. Hello. My name is Iko Kabashima. With a track record of prosperity as a popular Japanese politician, Kabashima is back in Nebraska to share his recipe for success, effective leadership, and agricultural sustainability at the institution that helped him all those years ago. Well, he's wicked smart, uh, no question about that. Uh, we had a chance to talk about uh, culture and approach to leading. And so I'm really excited to, uh, I got a chance to hear his insights um, about, uh, you know, basically how culture can eat strategy for lunch. And um, I think that's very true. We talked a lot about the importance of having a common shared vision. We talked a lot about um, the importance of teams. And so I think he, uh, his education and his persona fit very nicely into our fabric and our approach here in Nebraska. Kabashima took what he learned in the U.S. back to Japan and helped build a thriving prefecture. Today, Kumamoto ranks sixth in Japan in agriculture. It leads the country in exports of tomatoes and watermelon and supplies yellowtail, a fish popular in sushi. It's a good fit for the former husker. In Kumamoto, agriculture is a very important industry. So it's very resembled to Nebraska, you know. For Nebraska, agriculture is very important. And in that sense, you know, I study agriculture in 
University of Nebraska is very, very useful because I have a knowledge about agriculture. Usually, many governors do not have a similar kind of experience like me. You know, I know agriculture people to be happy because you have a very good, you know, hard memory too. Agriculture is very different. The lessons that he learned as an animal science major, the lessons he learned um, as an ag economist are exactly, I had exactly the tools he's applying to governing um, the most productive, uh, one of the most productive agricultural zones in Japan. I think the integrated systems thinking that Nebraska and the Institute are known for, I think that's exactly what the doctor ordered and having him come back and share a little bit with our students, pretty fantastic opportunity. The governor is also eager to see what's in store for the next generation of agriculture innovators and is ready to tackle challenges head on. After all, he's proof that having roots in ag can yield boundless opportunities and wants students to realize their potential. Uh, people think agriculture is not developing, but I think uh, agriculture has a very large potential because using uh, AI, smart agriculture, and that's, that's kind of uh, opportunity is now for you because uh, especially in the United States, you have a large land and uh, you can decrease cost, but population of the world is increasing and they have to eat. So uh, if you know the knowledge, how to decrease the cost of uh, production, how to increase the uh, 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 quality of agriculture goods, you have a very much chance of uh, getting large return. Once again, a special thanks to Governor Kabashima for making the time in his busy schedule to speak with us at Market Journal. Well, we've reached the end of the show. Next week, we'll talk to UNL Extension's Jim Jansen about how the flooding could impact your land values. Oklahoma State's Dr. Daryl Peel is here for the markets, and we'll have an update on what Nebraska Extension is doing to get farmers back out into the fields. Hope you can join us for all that and more. Until then, I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.